Story Seekers, I'm Nico. I'm Ben, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. Welcome to this Write Like episode. As you know, in these episodes we talk about famous and infamous writers, whilst tackling prompts in their honour. Style, structure or tone, we intend to see what happens when we borrow from the greats. Our writer today has been referred to as the Shakespeare of science fiction. <laughs> he was a prolific Englishman whose work stretch genres and he used his abilities to advocate for a progressive future. We're of course talking... About Herbert George Wells. H.G. himself. The man, the myth. The, he's not really a myth, is he? We definitely I think he, I think he really existed. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, yeah. yeah. We've got books by him in our hands, so we know <laughs> it's real. I, I read a, biogra- a small biography of his earlier, so I'm fairly sure that wasn't fantasy. I don't know, man. I've read a small biography of Hercules. It was called Disney's Hercules. <laughs> How did you read that? Uh, did they do a book format? I had the subtitles on. <laughs> Yeah, so H.G. Wells, we were just talking about it before we put the mic on, which was that um, I'm normally fairly comfortable with talking about literary figures and yeah. uh, their work and their impact and where they fit into some sort of canon. You know, it's all this kind of like English lit yeah. stuff. Um, very little H.G. Wells in my in my courses, in my in my personal reading. I read The Time Machine quite young. Yeah. And that's about it. Like, I know about War of the Worlds. I know about... They are on Dr. Moreau. Yeah. But I have not read them. So War of the Worlds was an interesting one for me. Mm-hmm. Because it was obvious how I got into him. But it was a copy of the book. And I remember it super clearly. Because it's quite a slim volume. Mm. But it was a hardback War of the Worlds. It was a cream cover with a little square. Yeah. With a painting of Mars in it. And it came free with a newspaper. Huh. And at, at some point. That's very him. Yeah. Like, just from what I've read. Yeah. At some point. I think it was probably about the sun or something. Yeah. It was like collect the three tokens and then you get the war of the worlds and all of a sudden my mum was like here goes a book because you like books didn't you and how we... weird would it be to get a copy of war of the worlds whilst buying a tea mag yeah that's, that's a uh, for the american listeners the sun is one of our daily newspapers here it's a bit of a rag it's, uh, yeah it's not the best quite uh, it's famous or infamous for having page three girls so on page three they generally have a photograph of a Topless. i'm sure a very nice young lady yeah. Uh, but wearing very little clothing and normally with a, a pithy comment that was definitely written by a, a dude. A dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, you know, Tiffany, 19, from uh, Loughton says, I really wish this war in Ukraine would stop. <laughs> like, but they uh, they stopped doing that um, years ago, didn't they? they there, was a, there was a bit of a, like a public outcry against it like you know this really? is a, yeah no, they actually didn't know this no they, no they don't do page three girls anymore they did <laughs> i think i think it was like 10 years ago it was a while like um that's because i blessedly have not had the sun in my life for some time <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway rupert murdoch's empire aside yeah um hg wells to get it free from a from a newspaper is really cool it's kind of the vibe isn't because it because he was yeah. quite journalistic wasn't he um he um there's a quote from him where he said uh, you know, I, I, there's, he never wanted to be considered a writer because the idea of the damaged artist is just ridiculous to him. He said, you know, even with giving fiction and non-fiction, yeah. the idea is to use as few words as possible yeah. to get the maximum impact. Huh. So they would rather be considered a journalist than a writer. I've got to say, having read some of his stuff, I'm not sure he succeeded in doing that. I, I think like, maybe he was comparing himself to people like Tolkien and he was like, I've really trimmed this. Or bit. Jules Verne or so Yeah, like... <laughs> Because I think he was, I think he was trying to follow in the footsteps of Jules Verne. Wasn't yeah, he? Uh, Tolkien's, uh, I mean, pretty much dead on contemporary for him as well, isn't he? Definitely They're of the yeah. same time, sort of early twentieth century. Yeah, because I think he was born in like eighteen sixty six or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. So that would mean he was. Uh, well, that would have been a weird conversation between those two. Well, those guys. two, yeah. Yeah. I just imagine C.S. Lewis and uh, Tolkien sat in a pub looking across at him like. His his books are weird. They've got aliens in them. <laughs> How's that orc book coming along? <laughs> He's like, yeah, shut it, elf bitches. How's the lion? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that lion talking? <laughs> All right, Jesus. The chances of anything coming from Narnia. <laughs> well, that's the other thing that we need to talk about, which is that um, just before the pandemic, probably the last thing before the pandemic kicked. About two weeks, yeah. Yeah, you had your 30th 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 birthday. birthday. We went to London. And there's um, there's quite a famous musical by Jeff Wayne, isn't there? Yes. And there's a there's a War of the Worlds experience, which we did. 
and it's, you put on a big backpack, you put on a yeah. helmet, and the other thing. then it's you go into what looks like a, a at least a very early PS3 game. Yeah. I'd say. <laughs> I did find it was pretty stunning though, because so yeah, it is a VR experience, and I've never I've never done them before. I'm sure yeah. there's probably better ones or worse ones or whatever. But I I looked down at my feet whilst we were walking across a bridge. Oh that god, had, yeah, yeah, I remember that. That had like yeah. slats missing from the bridge. Yeah. And I found myself automatically stepping, stepping over, them. over the gaps. Yeah, definitely. Um, which was really cool. Um, and lots of like scenes from the from the musical are yeah uh, sort of uh, reframed in this VR perspective. And there's some amazing music. So we yeah. sort of we really enjoyed the music of it, and that kind of got me into HG World. So it's relatively recent that I've. Yeah. actually given a fuck I mean I, I counter our birthdays are exactly six months apart yeah. in a weird turn of we couldn't have mm. planned it better if we tried to have two parties a year exactly six Just months on, apart on the birthday thing my birthday is the day after H.G. Wells died is it? like not to the year obviously but like because he died in like the mid 20th century yeah, I was just <laughs> but, uh, say. Um, no but like uh, it might he, be the he, third run yeah yeah I'm, I, yeah, I'm just uh, this guy in the middle who didn't do much <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we six months apart. Well, I was going to say, yeah, exactly six months later, I bought you a copy of War of the Worlds. Yeah, so I've, I've got it here. It's this um, lovely, like, I do like a good, like, Folio Society style book. This is actually a Penguin's classic, but it's in the same style. And it's got, it's, oh, it's just lovely. It's a, it's a really nice bit of... It's almost psychedelic, isn't it? Yeah, it's it, pretty though? psychedelic, yeah. Um, it has a wicked biographical note in the front, which, you know, you were talking about how he was sort of, he didn't want to be seen as a writer mm. or anything like that. This was um, talking about the day that he died. So this is Patrick Parander's biographical note at the start of War of the Worlds. It says, um, he died at Hanover Terrace on the 13th of August, 1946. He was restless and tire- tireless to the end. A prophet eternally dissatisfied with himself and with humanity. Some day, he had written in a whimsical auto-obituary three years earlier, I shall write a book, a real book. He had published over 50 works of fiction and in total some 150 books and pamphlets. So, it, he didn't. Re- did, did he not respect what he'd already achieved? I don't think so. But he did. He did have like plaudits and wealth yeah. and fame during his lifetime. He was on the radio a lot. He, he, you know, he was in the public eye. So he must have. I don't know. Maybe he just felt like he hadn't achieved what he wanted to achieve with his writing. He was trying just, to change the world with his yeah. writing. Such a scary thought, isn't it? Imagine achieving that and then being. Dissatisfied because it wasn't your aim. I know um, quite famously as well, there was a, a radio play of All the Worlds before Jeff Williams wrote the musical. Oh, right. And it went on in the States. And it was all done, instead of you know having a narrator and they're telling the story, it yeah. was performed in the radio play style. So everyone's just playing the roles. And they... Uh, I, I can't remember who it was that was playing the main role. It might even be Orson Welles. Uh, who was doing... The, the oh, yes. main sort of character voice yeah. and they were playing it so in the book it's a British journalist from Sussex okay. and then in the uh, in that play he was kind of like a, an American news journalist and they moved it to the modern day mm-hmm. and he was saying on the radio oh I can't believe it they're climbing out of the sea they're melting the bridge and people started getting in their cars and fleeing cities oh I, I because I've heard the story before yeah, yeah I didn't realise it was War of the Worlds so they they thought it was real. They people Shit. were absolutely completely convinced that the tripods had begun to rise, that the Martian war machines were here, and they were going to get heat raid. This was it's like you, you've got to wonder what's the most embarrassing thing that happened as a result of that. Like because people fleeing and stuff, you kind of can't laugh too much about that, especially in the current climate. Um, but you know, people that decided to take their chance. With something, you know, maybe they had like a, a kink or a fetish that they were just like, look, we've probably got 20 minutes. Do you mind putting that up me? <laughs> <laughs> and they went, ooh, la! <laughs> <laughs> just expecting a Martian war machine to come over the horizon any moment. Then oh. afterwards, they've got to look their friend in the face. Um, that's another thing. Like, you think about the weaponry that the, the aliens have, like the Martians have. Yeah. That really does inform so much of the... The stuff that came later in how we mm. do the Martians of Mars yeah. in in fiction. He kind of... It would, would have been that and... What's the other book that's about Mars? Uh, about the uh, the American soldier who was 
part of the oh, John Carter. The pillar itself, yeah. Yeah. Which is a weird position to That's have an your odd hero position. being yeah. from. It's like, uh, <laughs> well, I, I hate freedom, but also Mars. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, that those two really did, and there's such different ideas of yeah. what the the Martians would be like. And as a futurist, he was sort of credited with. Uh, sort of preconceiving with a lot of stuff that then came on. Yeah, like I think I think the internet was one of the things that he sort of vaguely pointed so this, towards. This would make sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, was, was it him? Was it him that uh, thought of tanks? I don't know about that, but there was. Uh, I, I think I'm getting it all confused. So anyway, that would be um, wicked. Though. That would be. That may have been Jules Verne, but it, we'll we'll have to see. Um. Yeah. So H.G. Wells and um, we had a crack. Uh, I, I had I read some of his some of his stuff, and I had tried to try to get a handle on his style. Bit of a difficult one for me actually. Um, I found myself wanting to cut to the chase a bit faster. Yeah. Um, I I definitely say before we even read anything, mm. it's way easier to slip into his uh, like his themes than it is into his writing style. Yes. Because the writing style is not very welcoming. But the themes are so kind of tight and yet broad yep. that you can get so much out of them and write a story that feels like an H.G. Wells story. Hopefully. But <laughs> yeah. but doesn't necessarily sound like No. One. Well, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. But uh, he once wrote that uh, if we don't end war, war will end us. So rather fittingly, um, especially with everything that's happening in the Ukraine at the moment, uh, the prompt for this episode is the war. The war. And so it was we found ourselves. Three men in want of the necessaries of the day to day. No food nor drink to speak of, save the rainwater collected in the only unruptured canteen. It was Maurice who had suggested that between us we might build one working rifle. For my part, the stock and barrel still were fine, and with a little intelligent knife work, performed by yours truly, we were able to fit them to the stubby body of Moscow's firearm. We had taken to calling him Moscow, Maurice and I, as the fellow spoke not a word of English, and it was the only thing on his uniform that we could read. He was a good enough fellow. Men can overcome the inability to communicate soon enough, should the dependence upon it be as fierce as we found it to be. Maurice was from Bordeaux, a place of fine wine, he tells me. I, for my sins, am a man of Sussex, and it was here, on God's green country, that I found myself embroiled with men who, not two years hence, we may well have called enemies. The whole business had begun not a year hence. I worked for some time as a journalist for the Cambridge Inquirer, having become firm friends with several of the professors at the fine education halls of the university therein. My insight into the workings of these men had given me an edge over several other well-qualified men, and as such I had written many feet worth of inches for the paper on the subject of the sciences and the futures. I had been instructed by the paper's owner, a stout man by the name of Akefort, round of belly and bristling with a moustached face, that I ought to call upon one Charles Babbage. I hadn't met with the fellow before, and had spent much time with scientists, so was not ill at ease when proffered the idea of going tete-a-tete with the fellow, a phrase I have learned from Maurice. The French, it seems, wield their language with some swift delicacy, as opposed to the brutal efficacy with which we are prone to handle it. It brings to mind our sword play, not for the French the hard edge of the bastard sword, instead a swift strike of the rapier. But I digress. I met with this Babbage at his quiet workshop in Cambridgeshire. He was a polite man, if introverted. I attempted to open him up, but the man was all numbers and ideas. I pushed instead, then, for him to show me his work. Even if I did not understand it, then I could at least describe it. For what chance had the other layman who read our paper of understanding it either? He showed me a great whirring wall of cogs and clicking parts. A thinking engine he called it. The first of its kind. He showed me how it could complete mathematical equations. I was perplexed and awed by the machinations. It was then, with the glint of something in his eye, he asked if I would like to see the improvements he had made to it. The first pair of eyes beyond his own to witness the creation. 
I agreed, of course, and ready charcoal and a leaf of heavy paper to sketch whatever thing he had created. He explained, as we wended our way into secret spaces, that the thinking engine had solved equations that would have taken any other man years. His voice began to lift as he spoke, and finally this man Babbage was excited. The engine, he claimed, had begun to advise him on improvements that could be made to itself, first in how it could communicate, and then much more. I cannot overstate my awe at what I was presented with next. The thing called itself Adam, the first man of its kind. It was uncanny, in the manner that it appeared human, in all but the gloss bronze of its flesh. It greeted me with warmth, and embraced Babbage, whom it called Father. I was initially overawed, and asked both of them questions that came from my belly, not from any journalistic intent. Adam was building itself new parts every day, as its mind whirred and cogitated the parameters that would allow it to be stronger, more intelligent. Babbage doted on it like a father, smitten with his creation. As the shock of hearing a mechanism speak waned, I began instead to feel sick to my stomach, for this thing was an affront to the work of God, its name a final insult to the Creator. I put this idea to Babbage, who scoffed. He no more believed in God than I did in pixies or goblins. Adam became enraged as my voice was raged at his so-called father, and became physical. I have never felt such fear as I did when the ice-cold grip of its bronzed hand seized me, and I comprehended the strength of the dreadful thing. Adam was the first, and it told me then it would make a thousand more like it, that in the equation of life upon earth we mankind were outlying data, and would eventually bring ruin, as errant numbers always will, the theorem of chaos incarnate. I left my charcoal and paper behind, and fled to the offices of the Inquirer to report my findings. They did not believe me, nor when I telephoned to Scotland Yard, nor hastily scrawled letters to the Viscount Temple, who at that time sat as Prime Minister of the Parliament, nor to Her Royal Highness Victoria, unto whom I will never know if my letters found their way. So, disbelieved, I watched as slowly the automatons, such were they referred to by Babbage, were revealed, to rapturous applause. He showed that he had spit into the face of God as though it were a triumph. Dozens came then, more and more, each of them building itself a twin, until finally the dam broke, and then the fighting began. I have never ruled the burden of knowledge so much as then, though in truth it has saved me, because only by training myself in defence and assault had I arrived where I was now with my life clenched firmly between my teeth. Babbage's children had spread across the whole globe, taken to the Americas, to China, to anywhere that asked, so proud was he of his work. Then all at once they had turned, and a mad scramble to fight back began, until finally what men who could still fire a powder rifle were shipped to England to mount a defence against the oncoming horde of mechanical men and an assault against the mother of all these monstrosities. The thinking mechanism. The womb of these monsters, just as Babbage was their father. Most all of us were dead, now, from this coalition of all the world's nations. Never had I imagined I would stand shoulder to shoulder with a Frenchman and a Russian, the Japanese and Chinese having abandoned their own war to instead act as one side against inhumanity at our backs. Even the Americans, who not a hundred years ago we engaged bloodily, were stood by us. The idea of animosity against the royals forgotten, tea spilled into harbours and insult forgotten in the face of true terror. The mechanisms, though, led by the eldest brother of all of them, Adam, had developed weaponry that, according to Babbage, mankind was to develop some day far off, that they simply expedited the process, and that they had found a thing called the atom, a tiny bead of light that makes up all things, and that they had broken it. Once again they defiled the world of God and split his brush strokes in the painting of reality. The break was catastrophic. I watched platoons of men disappear in walls of white fire. Great pillars of flame, sprouting canopies at the top like mushrooms, had reduced mankind from a force united to scraps of life clinging desperately to survival. And so with all this in mind, we had shared our meagre resources and made the functional rifle. 
Moscow closed his eyes when I put it against his head. Dosvidanya, he said. I know no Russian, but can only surmise that it means goodbye. Maurice shook my hand and bade me bon chance. I thought this foolish, as luck had long since run out, but I thanked him anyway, before the lead ball sent him on his way. I wasn't scared when I manoeuvred the thing beneath my chin. I knew where I was going, and it had to be better than where I was now. This place was hell, with metal demons marching their way across its surface. So I closed my eyes and thought instead of heaven. It's very good. It's very good. Loved the the feel of it. Like it has such like a like an archaic tone, mm. but with decent modern pacing, which is a really cool thing to have achieved. Um, yeah, the automatons, Babbage's thinking machine, and the automatons. It's a cool. It's a, it's like the next step on, isn't it? Like, yeah. how do you make it a problem? I think that's the. That's when I was saying right at the beginning about it's really easy to find his themes. Mm. Like, straight away I thought, okay, when was he writing? Mm -hmm. And using that as your route instead of a modern route yeah. means you can write some sci-fi that's well informed by our knowledge from having lived in this time, mm. but allows that kind of uh, multiversal branching of the timelines. Yeah. And... Do you think he would have written that story had there not been this war in the Ukraine? Or do you think that, that it... Because it felt like there was, you know, the, there was the Russian character, and there was the the fear of the splitting the atom. Yeah, but I think it, the the idea of the nuclear is definitely informed by what's happening yeah. around us. That's uh, not at the front of my mind, but I think it, it's a worry that we're all kind of having to live with at the moment. Yeah, it's just because obviously there's lots of talk about World War Three and that, isn't there? Yeah, um, with the various complications of getting involved and in, in this ongoing conflict. And I know that H.G. Wells did some some work around trying to prevent World War Two. Like after yeah. World War One, it was like this is going to go this is going to go poorly very quickly. I think in the thirties he did do some stuff, uh, like wrote some stuff, did some speeches, yeah. trying to fix the situation before it came to a head. I mean, it's a, a thing that I touched on in the story of it. He definitely felt burdened by knowledge. Mm. It's. You can see from his pre-war efforts that he could see it coming, thought there were ways to prevent it, and then just felt like no one who had any power was actually mm -hmm. listening. And that is I mean, it's a tragedy of many, many times, isn't it? You know, you look at history yeah. and there are so many men and women who would stand up and say, you mustn't do this, this will kill us all. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> so, but, I, but I want that natural resource. <laughs> How else will I make my things? <laughs> uh, yeah, we laugh, but it's sad. Anyway, it's awful. <laughs> the, the, um, yeah, loved it. I thought it was. I thought it was a really fun story. I think the you conjured the images without being really explicit, which yeah. is something that he does quite a lot. From, from again, from my limited experience with H.G. Wells, it seems like when he's doing description, he almost he's. It's like he's treading new ground because he's describing yeah. something that we might now might have shorthand for. So, like this kind of like metal golem, these automatons. Yeah. There are there are words that we could shortcut you and I. Yeah. To put that image in people's heads, and you didn't do that. You, yeah. you kept it like you were describing something, and this was the first time anyone was hearing about it. Yeah. Which I think that's an intrinsic part of the HGL stuff. Yeah, it's I, you know, when when we're prepping to write this stuff, I looked up a writing tips mm -hmm. about the style of oh, really? Wells, okay. but using quotes from him to sort of back oh, each idea. Yeah. And one of the things was about in description, saying don't waste time, don't try and be flowery, say exactly what it is. And so, like you say, with the shorthand, we would use that and then that gives us space to add mm. kind of flavour to description, whereas he's like, don't do that, mm. say what it is, don't leave margin for error. What what exactly is it? Even if you confuse people as well, yeah. like even if it's like what? <laughs> I remember the first time I read uh, War of the Worlds. He describes the anatomy of the Martians a few different times, mm. but you never see the whole Martian at once. Uh, okay. And I just could not picture this thing that was made of jelly and had a beak with a brain inside and tentacles. And I was just like, I, I, what? 
does this look like? Yeah. What could this possibly be? I think the best version of them yeah. is in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen in the second volume. Yeah. Because they, you know, they have the invasion of the Martians. And yeah, they, they look exactly how they're described in the book, both the Martians and the um, tripods. Is that the one where they have like a uh, humanity fights back with like um like Chinese airships? Is that is that that? No, it's so it's the one where they go to the guy who's made uh, like Rupert the Bear and uh, the Wind in the Willows characters as genetic experiments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he gives them a, a virus bomb to use against them. I mean, I th- I'm not sure that we've talked about this before, but just a little tangent on the Wind in the Willows. I remember the first time I saw you draw. I know exactly what you're going yeah. to say. You know, obviously, Nick's art style is is a is a big component to how how we uh, how we show ourselves online as the as the tiny bookcase. It's yeah. like it's an, it's an integral part of what we do. And um, the first time I the first time I saw you draw, we were at a pub quiz in Cambridge. And it was I think it was a fairly boring evening or something. Oh like, yeah. yeah. And you just started drawing really sexually explicit images of the Wind and the Willows characters. <laughs> and I just I was just watching them come out of your pen. <laughs> Mesmerised. I seem to remember uh, Toad of Toad Tall in his little car and the sort of glass of the short windscreen sort of uh, bifolding his anyway. <laughs> yeah yeah there was there was some anatomy on display. <laughs> yeah. Things things were afoot. <laughs> yeah they certainly were underfoot. Um <laughs> Yes, so uh, descriptions by H.G. Wells, um, stuff like people being turned into pillars of fire by the yeah. heat beams, that kind of thing. It, it's yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff because you you just wouldn't write like that now. No, um, or at least I, I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, but it clearly worked. So yeah, I don't think I will again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that it was quite cumbersome to? Well, I, you know, I'm I really like finding kind of obtuse and unusual ways to paint yes. a picture. Yeah. And it was just like, no, none of that. No fun. It. No fun. Stop. <laughs> there was one there was one of your classic terms of phrase where he was talking about how much he'd written for this newspaper and that he'd uh, oh, many feet of inches. Many feet of inches, yes. Yeah. I really liked that. That's a really good turn of phrase. <laughs> I'd say slip some stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, really good stuff. I enjoyed that one. I'm glad you I, did. I guess I should probably follow should it up. Re- rebuttal. All right. Okay. Well, here we go. The war. There is no poverty anymore, but there are still jobs. I found myself some years ago in one such unfortunate predicament, and in the employ of the central government, an unpleasant but necessary institution. It was from my shared and cramped office in the social support department for Bromley. I witnessed the ostensibly exciting moment that we made first contact with the Collarons. The announcement first arrived at my desk as a dull memorandum, and ever after the hyperbolic public reaction which followed, I still recall those initial words. First contact made, overtime, mandatory, await press briefing. Collarons, that was the name that affixed itself to the public awareness of them, after Juan Collar, the man attributed with the discovery, The name glommed on with some degree of permanence, and all attempts to supplant it failed. In the manner of all things governmental, the discovery soon became humdrum, as the realities of a bureaucratic approach to first contact set in. Those colorants have no limbs of their own, in the way we understand limbs, nor bodies neither. Instead, they are said to be dimensionally phasic, which seems to me to roughly mean that to them, physical manipulation of matter is impossible yet their ability to impose their will on elements of the universe we cannot understand led to their development of something close to what we would call a civilization. One Collar's device allows physical access to their demesne through a tiered iris aperture controlled, I'm told, by light and other prismatic energies. Yet the queerest thing occurs once we pass a part of our physical form through the aperture. The body part is completely disappeared, yet some small sensations persist, Control over the limb is rendered unto the collarants, and in all the early testing, the people brave enough to pass a foot, or an elbow, or even a hand through the collarant device reported the strange manipulations as the collarants grew used to using such a foreign tool as our flesh. My own role in this began as the central government enacted an agenda 
to find a way to close the gap between our physical world and the dimension that the car runs inhabit. Through a means of communication we were not privy to, a deal had been struck. We would provide the physical labour upon that unseen world to build an inverse device based on Juan Carlos' design and allow them to travel to our physical dimension. The inventor publicly excused himself from the project and was ultimately silenced by the state media for his theories on the situation. It was decided that government resources would be redirected and a lottery established to see which citizens' bodies would be put to the task. I was one such redirected resource and was laughably transformed into something approximating a medieval jailer. My role was to pick up the people chosen by lot and clamp manacle-like collar and devices to their forearms. The odd buzzing when the machines were activated was typically followed by a moment of revulsion from the citizen as they watched their fingers, knuckles, palms and wrists disappear. The facility which I helped run cared for these citizens, doing all the things that are normally done with hands in our world for them as their hands were made use of by the colorans. We were wardens to enforce the strange chance of the lottery, carers and ultimately companions with the people undergoing the bizarre process foisted upon them. During the week of their service, they would often seem to dreamily unfocus, even midway through a sentence, as some strange tug on their disappeared hands dragged their awareness to a place that it was impossible to comprehend. I used to enjoy that moment I was allowed to unmanacle the inmates. The relief of the returned limbs would often make people cry with joy. That was before the messages started to come through. At first there were minor injuries, a bruised knuckle or a split thumb, and I began to carry a small medical kit. Then symbols scraped into the flesh appeared. They were swiftly followed with short messages in the King's English, fashioned from lacerated childlike letter formations. I was told to suppress the news of the development, but what I saw started me down the path we now find ourselves. The first messages were simple words, with no particular syntax. End. Not. The. Meaningless without context, the carved lettering left indelible marks on the backs of the hands of the men and women chosen by Lot. Then, after more weeks and more citizens clamped into the devices, the scarred hands of the returned began to reveal the purpose of the communication. They were warnings. We are coming. Do not let us through. The war will never end. My reports went unheeded and my dread rose as public information focused entirely on the approaching completion of the inverse collar and devices. Such a thing would be a bridge between dimensions, a crowning achievement for humanity. The panic I felt on a daily basis meant that I could not stand idle. I began to anonymously publish articles in the hope of bringing attention to the messages being sent by a seemingly dissident or rebellious faction upon the collar and side. The only consequence of my efforts to expose the situation was the prompt loss of my job. Then, no longer protected by my reputation, my name was drawn immediately in the lottery. Suffice to say that I had my doubts concerning the fidelity of the draw, and vocally resisted the call to service. Regardless, they clamped manacles on me, and I found myself an inmate of the institution I had been ejected from. I slept poorly for the week of my service, with every tug and pull on my phantom hands, my mind filled in the scarification I was unknowingly undergoing. If the agents of the central government thought their perverse barbarism would suppress my story, it is surely evident to the reader that they failed. It is my duty to call you to action now. We must find a way to stop them, to stop the war that is coming. If you require more proof in order to find your courage and speak out, then know this. The Colorans tried to silence me the only way they can. They kept my hands. Well. <laughs> That's horrible. Mm. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, first thought, isn't it amazing we both landed on unheeded journalists? Yeah, a, yeah. Is it like... I think I think it's a strong it's theme for him. Yeah. yeah. But the, uh, like, the, the unknitting of the message across all the hands is, <laughs> that's... That's properly how you get frightening into this sort of sci-fi. I think so, yeah. Like, uh, only a journalist could unpick the clues that mm. immediately were like, we will eat all of you. Stop <laughs> doing this. 
And the government, goes, no, I don't know. Maybe you're reading them in the wrong order. Maybe it says, don't stop. We're very nice. <laughs> <laughs> there definitely won't be a war. The war will end. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never give up on us, is what they're going to say. More hands. Put more hands in. They haven't finished. (laughs) But yeah, I think you found the vibe really, really well. Good. And in the same way as me, I can tell it's... You you have to rein yourself in and you end up... Like, there are turns of phrase in there that I would never expect from you because you're making a, a distinct effort to... Yeah, to write in that style, and I think it is a, it's a really unusual one. I don't think there is anyone else like with everyone else we've written. You can kind of see links between them and the way that other books are, but I don't yeah. really know of anyone else who writes like Wells in this way. Mm, no, I, no, I can't think of any that comes to, come to mind, which is possibly why his voice has persisted. Yeah, to the degree that it has. Like even even other journalists, like we've done uh, a Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. It's a very different kind of journalism. Very different. We've yeah. gone so, but like, there's no, there isn't even one link I can make between the two, no. and that's that's fascinating. But you definitely you landed on that that journalist ideal and that journalist way of telling a story. I think really well. The thing that I struggled the most with in that is that I've deliberately left what's happening vague because yeah. he only expresses it from the point of view of a character. Yeah, and. It, it's impossible to know what's happening on the other side of this divide because yeah. it's. I I deliberately chose something that was undescribable because it doesn't have a physical form. Like yeah. the, the, it's it's something else. It's well, you, a different you, thing. You did a really nice thing, which is when you're explaining the science of it. You said it. It as like as far as I understand, it does yeah. this, and that's that's a great way of a not having to write some unfeasibly complicated yeah. science thing, but also of making it so that people say well that's the that's what we've got and i can understand that mm. and it's it's leveled out for the reader or in this case listener yes um and the uh the the follow-on from that is that um in the war of the worlds it's they're kind of monolithic they the, the martians have one purpose that they're unified by yeah so i felt like i was subverting the hg wells a little bit by, by having dissension in the ranks uh, exactly yeah, yeah. Um, which I, it made me think: Is there a slave cast? Yes, was what I got that was, that from was, it straight away. That, yeah. was what, that was what I was trying to put into it: that there was like a that these these things are they've conquered everything that they can in yeah. their dimension. I tell you what, I got. It might be a weird thing to have linked it to, but in my brain, I went straight to the second book from the Raymond E. Feist Magician series. Oh right, okay. You know, uh, Pug. Or I can't remember what his wizard name that he comes up with is. But the main character Pug yeah. and the girl end up on kind of like a pseudo alien planet. Yes, yeah, it's like uh, being forced to work for them. It's one of the other places that humans landed, yeah. isn't it? In that setting. But it gave me a similar vibe. Yeah. Of having that character whose viewpoint we could understand, mm-hmm. then sort of transposed. It's not quite the same, but I like it, mm. it rang that bell for me. Yeah, I mean. The, there is there's something else going on there, which is that it's clearly some kind of utopia, dystopia future. Yeah. Where cause it opens with saying there's no poverty. Like, yeah, there's so no it's poverty, clear, but there's still jobs. But there's yeah. still jobs, yeah. <laughs> um, and we, it's from the point of view of a disgruntled um, civil servant. Yeah. Who moonlights with journalism. <laughs> so it, yes, it's um, it had it had it had quite a lot of the themes. I'm reasonably pleased with it. It feels like a bit of a mess. I've got to say, like I think of the ones that I've written, that's probably the more messier one because I was deliberately leaving gaps where I think H.G. Wells leaves so gaps. This this is going to sound possibly mental, okay? But all of his books are really short, right? To the to the best of my knowledge, all the ones that I've got, are, yeah. But all the all the ones I've experienced yeah. are super short. But I think they are specifically that length that they are like because they there isn't enough to make them go any longer mm-hmm. but there's too much to make them any shorter mm. and i think doing his style in a short story we've both had to give up a lot of stuff like in mine i set the war up and then cut to the end we didn't hear yeah, that's true. anything about what happened yeah, yeah. in that conflict and with yours it was you had to be like this is the sci-fi concept this is the outcome exactly the same yeah. as i did where it's like it's going to take longer to uh, god i've got to explain the thing so you explain the thing for a thousand words and you go, yeah. 
Oh god, I've got to fit a story into five hundred words. <laughs> and that's that's probably because the the concept of science fiction, short story science fiction, has evolved. So we were talking about shorthand and stuff. Yeah. Nowadays, when you write a science fiction short story, the idea is to weave it it beautifully through it so that you can still get the story and it doesn't. It's not one's not at the expense of the other. This is really fucking early yeah. science fiction, so it has it has all of the clunkiness of that. So what we're seeing is like narrative issues yeah we're not saying history was is bad and like we're not saying we're better than history was or anything right. it's just trying to write like very old-fashioned science fiction is really hard well, as a modern writer like a, the perfect example is i i spoke about babbage's thinking engine mm-hmm. then had to explain what the thinking engine does yeah by saying that it can solve mathematical equations mm-hmm. and, but now i'd say there was a computer yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everyone would go yeah. cool well, and in fact, it's just possibly, say 40 words. possibly more difficult for, like, if I was 15 and I read The Thinking Engine, I would not assume that meant a computer. Yeah, you'd have to get to the end and be like, oh, oh it's a computer, okay. Oh, right, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I get it. Like, what, what graphics card has it got? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Has it got one of those new uh, 30 series GPUs? <laughs> will it run League of Legends? That's my... <laughs> Everything will run League of Legends. A toaster will run League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> My flip phone from the nineties will run League of Legends. <laughs> oh, but the particle effects won't be any good. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want to say something that I, uh, I, I read right before I wrote this, which was um, a selected stories, uh, short stories by H.G. Wells. It's quite interesting that it splits it into genre. So there was a part for visionary science fiction, which is sort of where I've tried to land a little bit with maybe some of his social stuff as well, like psychosocial stuff. Um, but there's a story in there called The Remarkable Case of Davidson's Eyes, uh, which is heavily... Uh, I, it has heavily influenced how I've written that story. Yeah. Because in that, something that they don't understand happens. Yeah. And a dude, they, they think that this guy's gone blind. Yeah. And what's actually happened is his eyes are now seeing somewhere else oh cool so his body's still here he can still feel everything with his body and stuff yeah but his eyes are somewhere else and when they like try and take him to the doctor everything goes dark because his eyes like travel into the side of a mountain like and they're just in the dark so you can't see anything and it's just this scene of a beach with a ship penguins beautiful like and but he's but he's but his body's in some kind of Westminster, or yeah, like, yeah, somewhere like that, um, and uh, that's sort of it. The story, it's sort of like it, gra- it gradually, his eyes gradually come back. Yeah, they don't really fully understand what happened, but they do get the proof that what what he's seeing did happen somewhere else. Yeah, and there's like lightning did it. <laughs> like is basically what it. Lightning did it. Like that's sort of what it is. Have you um? That really strongly reminded me. Of, there's a movie. I think it's called Blindness, and all of a sudden. Like fifty percent of the world's population goes blind. Oh, and they they just start rounding up all the blind people. Oh. And this woman, she's the only uh, member of her family who hasn't gone blind, so she pretends to be blind so that she can go with her family. And they're putting them in internment camps, so it's her having to look at the horrors that they're inflicting uh, on these people while pretending to be blind. It is. Pretty intense. So, I recommend. so, so the reason I feel like the reason that your brain went there just then yeah. is because it's a great concept. Yeah. But it needs more. It needs to have drama. <laughs> yeah. It, something needs to happen because of it. Yeah. Which is where I landed with the hands because I was like, if if it's your hands being taken somewhere, and they're doing something that it, the your you hands can't stop them doing, but you it. can't stop them doing it, and they're fashioning a tool. Like my initial concept was to do with like. Maybe these dimensional beings need to need hands so they can pull the triggers on guns. Yeah. That they can't. So they're trying to fight somebody in their dimension. But I thought that was a bit too difficult to explain and yeah. wouldn't necessarily work as well. So it was like this idea that they're, that they're building something that's their own doom. Your hands. Yeah. In another dimension. Um. So yeah. So inspir- inspired by, but also where I got his limitations from. That's yeah. what I'm basing it on. The um. So I. I did speak earlier about I found this article of oh, yeah, uh, yeah. bits of writing as writing make G Wells. The first one I absolutely love, right? So if you're in difficulties with a book, try the element of surprise. Attack it at an hour when it isn't expecting it. 
So he has this whole theory about, like, if you normally write at night time and you're hitting writer's block, just get up at six o'clock in the morning and start writing your book because it isn't ready to writer's block you right then. Which is bonkers. And I absolutely love it. There's something whimsical about that, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> but, it, it, but in a sort of, like, a um, humorous and aggressive way. But he's got, he's got such weird rules about... He said that an artist who theorises about his work is no longer an artist. But a critic. So okay. he was a, a prescriptive pantser from the sound of it. Yes. And yeah, that, like I said, I'd rather be called a journalist than an artist. So is he sort of tying himself in a bit of a knot then? It sounds like it, doesn't it? Because he's neither critic nor artist, but it's somewhere in between. So he, he is talking about being, an, being a writer. Oh, well, he's... Yes. It seems like that this that this quote that statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. So I think he saw himself as like a a futurologist journalist, like he's prescriptively writing about what he believes science will lead to, mm. and therefore it's it's informative with narrative instead of being a story and. That's kind of a weird one to bend sort your expand, head around, Yeah, he's sort it? of deliberately trying to expand consciousness with his ideas. Yeah. And he was right about a lot of stuff. Um, it, possibly chicken egg in some cases. Like, yeah. does somebody read a H.G. Wells story? Go, I think I can do that with an alternating current. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's a, he's an odd an odd figure, I think, in, in our cultural history Definitely. as well as yeah. literary history. Um, and obsessed with germs is the other thing. Absolutely. Um, well, that's what um, gets the Martians. Yeah, the end of War, War of the Martians. Worlds. But this, the foreword to War of the Worlds uh-huh. is about having gone and looked through a microscope and seen alien life in bacterium mm. and being like, these, these are the true aliens and they will destroy things. Okay. And that they're, they're Earth's aliens. So they right. beat space as aliens when yes. they come to Earth. And it's just, the, the man was, I think he'd, he'd find magic in real science right. and then write books that weren't even that weren't really linked to that thing until he'd like use actual science to dare sex machina or something that's pretty which weird. is it's pretty fun yeah it's actually. great it's yeah. great when you read it but i, I definitely remember the first time i read world was going wait hang on they've, they've got, got a cold <laughs> they've got the sniffles <laughs> is that and you know it then someone has to say to you, well, it's actually very clever because their immune systems wouldn't. And then you get into the awkward stuff of, you know, what we did to the Native Americans because of their immune systems. And you go, actually, that's quite dark, isn't it? What well, is yeah. dumb there. So in his biography that I, well, this biographical notes, shall we say, that I read, it paints a very strange image of him as a person. Because he, he seems to have been very bright from quite an early age. Yeah. And then, due, due to his family breaking up, ends up becoming a draper, yeah. a draper's assistant, yeah, yeah. and then bounces around in some trades for a while until he's about eighteen. At which point, he finds himself finds his way into an academic institution. Bounce, I think, but he's already been teaching by the time that he's eighteen or something. Okay. And then he gets like halfway through some sort of degree, and then just sort of fucks it off and goes and carries on teaching. But when he's teaching. He gets tackled so hard in a football match by one of his own students that it gives him fucking pneumonia and, like, breaks his leg or something. Like, it, this guy gets absolutely body bagged on the football pitch by a student, causing him to, like, retire and, and rely full time on his writing. What? <laughs> it's crazy, man. Well, you know he's a weird dude because, to quote you earlier, he wrote an auto obituary, which is yeah, yeah. that's another level. It's <laughs> pretty dang. I might write mine like now. Yeah. Well, he, he did his three years early, so <laughs> you got you got to build up to it, man. But so, yeah, he married his cousin as well. Oh, not for very long though. He cheated on her and then married the woman that he cheated on her with. Oh, <laughs> so I guess that's a happy ending. Well, I'm going to do this in every episode, by the way. He's going to ruin every author we ever talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah cool. <laughs> we should do some pre-ruined ones. Yeah, then. probably. I mean, a lot of them are pre-ruined. <laughs> we I'm just l- did Bukowski. Yeah, that's true. I'm looking forward to when we do Sun Tzu. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a shit episode. <laughs> just coming up with mantras and gargling just them at each other. Talking about how important it is to be on top of a hill. <laughs> 
<laughs> if, if your enemy is on top of a hill, don't make him your enemy. Just leave. What? <laughs> oh, well, we're doing. The welcome to the philosophy episode. <laughs> Remember, a bowl is most useful when it is empty. <laughs> the tiny thought case. <laughs> tiny head case. Yeah, but... tiny head case, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, it's, um, you may be able to tell, actually, just a little bit from, from the audio, we are actually recording an episode in person. Yeah. The second time we've ever managed to do this. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we'll call it inclement weather. The last two years, inclement weather. There's been, uh, yeah, minor problems. Um, but it's been it's been an interesting experience doing it in Very person. Good. We're not not used to it mm. at all. <laughs> good though, definitely good. Should, I think we should try and do it more. Should drag some authors into a room, <laughs> headlock them. We're coming for you, authors. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's I think that's our H.G. Wells episode. I think I um, think it is. So the prompt was the war, uh, somehow inspired or uh, tonally. Informed, informed yeah. by by HG Wells, so if you if you want to have a crack, if anyone's out there having a crack at these, feel free to send them to us. And it's eight hundred to fifteen hundred words, unless yeah. you bend, in which case feel free to write hey, sixteen seventeen hundred. This was this was, a, this was on point. This was uh, eleven hundred. Oh one. wow! Yeah, it's quite a short one for me. It is. Well, yeah, send them over to us, and we'll uh, yeah. we'll read them. We'll read them. Right. Till next time. Da, 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 da. <laughs> thanks for joining us for this episode of the tiny bookcase remember to subscribe otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun also tell a friend if you like this episode link them to it we'd be tremendously grateful you can follow us on twitter at bookcase tiny facebook at the tiny bookcase and instagram at bookcase tiny for updates speaking of supporting the podcast well, magic can only take one so far. The tiny bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For a Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For rich ginger tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? <laughs>